Uh, over the next three lectures, um, what I want to do is give you a sense of some of the issues that the Jewish community in Canada uh, had to face uh, as it was making a transition from a situation of immigration uh, from Europe, and largely from Eastern Europe, of course, uh, to North America. And uh, from, in what some cases was a rural uh, way of life, although not for all by any means, and I'll talk about that tomorrow more than today, um, to uh, a situation where uh, the Jews uh, became socially mobile and in so doing had to confront uh, a number of prejudices, uh, different forms of discrimination, uh, as they did. Um, it's uh, interesting for me personally to be in Kiev because I grew up in Winnipeg, uh, which is in the center of Canada, and the, uh, the uh, urban landscape of Winnipeg sometimes looks a lot like the urban landscape of Kiev, and I will show that to you in tomorrow, uh, or on Thursday, actually, when I talk about Western Canada. Uh, when I went to school, the, the public school that I went to was about one-third Jewish, one-third Ukrainian, and one-third other. And we called the others English. Uh, but they could have been many different things. Uh, some of them were, in fact, of uh, English or Scots or Irish ancestry. Uh, some were Métis. In other words, they were uh, children of families uh, that had parents. One might have been an indigenous parent and another Scot or French. Uh, so when I was uh, in the plane yesterday between Warsaw and Kiev, uh, it reminded me of the bus that I used to take from my house to go to the center of Winnipeg because I heard all the same languages. Uh, so it's a, a place that's for me both foreign but not strange, if you see what I mean. Uh, so uh, today I'm going to start in a, in a way that may be a bit surprising. Um, I'm going to be talking a lot about Christianity and uh, in order to talk a little bit about the uh, the uh, experience of Jewish people in Montreal. And uh, I'm going to be talking a lot about France, and that's because the elites in Montreal, the French-speaking elites, uh, both in the church and outside the church, were very highly influenced by intellectual movements in France, especially in the first part of the 20th century. Uh, that, begin that began to change quite a bit uh, with the Second World War when many of the most prominent uh, intellectuals from Montreal, from French-speaking Quebec, started to study in the United States uh, and brought back with them certain notions in the social sciences, which uh, brought in a different way of thinking about things. But even in terms of the reforms that took place, um, France continued to play uh, a very important role. So I want, to fig uh, I want to focus today on a particular figure, this man, uh, whose real name, real name, his pre-clerical name, I'll put it that way, is Pierre, Pierre Couturier. And OP stands, does anyone know what OP stands for? It stands for Order of Preachers, uh, which means that he was a Dominican, right? And the Dominicans are always, uh, you can always tell the Dominicans by their white robes, right? Uh, there's a uh, street in Paris called the Rue des Blancs Manteaux, the street of white coats. And it's where the Dominican church was, and the Dominicans can always be seen uh, wearing this. So when Pierre Couturier became a priest, he took the name Marie-Alain, right? just, uh, just uh, so you know. He lived from the end of the 19th century, from 1897 to 1954. Uh, he died fairly young uh, because he had a respiratory illness, which at the time wasn't treatable. But what I want to talk about is the role that Maria Len Couturier played, uh, both in the church in France during his time in Quebec, during the Second World War, where he had a major role to play in two areas. One was uh, encouraging young artists, uh, non, uh, and encouraging especially non-figurative artists, 
So uh, in Quebec up until that time, the École des Beaux-Arts, the, the School of Fine Arts, uh, had encouraged uh, its students to really um, uh, work in genre painting, so historical painting, religious painting, and to a certain extent, um, urban and rural landscape painting. But Couturier made friends with a group of younger artists uh, who were more interested in non-figurative and abstract art. And uh, he took the position that uh, abstract art could in fact be a highly spiritual form of art. So that was one area where he made a big difference. And because he was a Dominican, uh, he uh, actually gave these young French Canadian artists a kind of protection because after all, he was a man of the church. And so uh, it enabled them to have a kind of freedom um, and uh, a kind of public visibility that they may not have had otherwise. I'll talk a little bit more about them later. The other major area where Couturier made a big difference is he mobilized opinion both within the church and within society at large, away from an initial support for the Vichy regime in France. So, I know about Vichy, I think, about Maréchal Pétain, and towards support for what was called La France Libre, you know, the, the forces of General de Gaulle, right? And uh, through his sermons, through his radio talks, uh, through uh, his articles in the press, through some books that he published, uh, he made a huge difference. And uh, the two were very much linked for him. Uh, and I'll explain this a little bit later, because for him, France was represented the country of liberty. And he noted how artists came from all over Europe to Paris to work in conditions of freedom that they felt they didn't necessarily have at home. Right? So uh, that essence of French identity uh, was also what he uh, promoted in art. Right? So that's... Um, when Couturier began uh, writing about art, he became the editor of a journal in France called Art Sacré. And Art Sacré had the position that what at the time was called L'Art de Saint-Sulpice. Have any of you been to Paris? Mm -hmm. No. Okay, so in Paris, there's this very big, clunky church called Saint-Sulpice. And all around Saint-Sulpice are the stores where religious art is sold. So art that decorates churches, right? And it's all plaster. Uh, it's all uh, what Couturier thought of as very sentimental, right? And he looked at this art and he thought, this is horrible. You know, there was a time when the church took on the greatest artists of its period to decorate its churches. Think of Michelangelo, right, in Italy. Uh, I could go on and on, but I think you understand what I mean. And he said, this is, you know, this is actually cheapening our spiritual mission. What the church has to do is go back in our own time and find the greatest artists and have them not only decorate our churches, but design them in terms of architecture. There was only a little problem with this in the 1930s, 1940s. Can you think what that problem might be? If you were in the Roman Catholic Church and you said, well, I have to ask the greatest artists of our time to decorate our churches. Mm -hmm. but what might the problem be? Um, there were not Christian at all, or? <laughs> exactly. So the big problem in France, especially, was that very few of these artists were practicing Christians or were practicing Catholics. Right? They, were, um, they were either non-believers, they were often Jews, uh, often they were communists, and sometimes both, right? And, but Couturier, uh, basically what he said is that uh, in a non-religious age, and he looked at his own time, and here we're speaking of France in the 1930s, uh, in the period between the two world wars, so he said that in an essentially non-religious age, if choosing artists would require great humility. In other words, the church couldn't be arrogant about this. It had to go out and put itself in a position of hum humility uh, because 
in order to work with the artists who were closest to life, right, least academic and most inspired, you would in fact have to call upon these non-Christians and non-believers. So he had a, a saying, when people challenged him on this, he liked to say, better a genius without faith than a believer without talent. Right? And that was kind of his motto. Um, in an interview with Harper's Bazaar, the American magazine, he elaborated on this. He said, we knew very well that some of these artists were not strictly speaking practicing Christians, that some were separated from us by serious divergences of a political as well as of an intellectual order. Trusting in providence, we told ourselves that a great artist is always a great spiritual being, each in his own manner. Right. So what are some of the projects that Couturier it did. Now, before the war, he was mainly in a position of advocating for this. And in, just before the war, he, um, he made an agreement uh, with the uh, diocese in the Alps, a part where there was a sanatorium uh, to decorate the church. But the war got in the way. But when he came back to France immediately after the war, he embarked on this project. So this is a little church up in the Alps near Chamonix, where people go to ski. Right? And it was part of a sanatorium complex in the town of Assis. Right? And uh, the, as you can see, the outside of the church uh, is decorated in a way that would be familiar to you if you think of the School of Paris uh, from the earlier part of the 20th century. Right? So who might have done that? Chagall, I think everyone recognizes a Chagall, right? So this is from inside the church. Right? Does anyone know, this is a tapestry. So as you can see, it's audacious in color, uh, in form, its style, it's very typical of the modern movement. Um, this is by a man named Jean Lursat, L-U-R-C with a little cedilla, A-T, who was a communist. Um, so he, um, he did this beautiful, beautiful tapestry for the church at Assis. This is uh, Fernand Léger, uh, who, uh, you, whose work was uh, quite important uh, in the 1920s, 30s, 40s. This is another church. Um, this is in an industrial city, a small industrial city in the east of France. Uh, very close to the German border called Belfort. And the city was very heavily, because it was an industrial city, it was very heavily damaged during the Second World War, very heavily bombed. And so at the end of the war, the parishioners uh, of this area decided to build themselves a new church. Uh, and uh, they did so by themselves. So it's a very simple church in its construction, um, nothing fancy. But Couturier convinced Fernand Léger to do the band of windows that goes all around the church. So Léger, of course, was a very active communist, but certainly not a practicing Christian uh, at this time. Here's a close-up of one of his windows. And uh, his windows are the 12 stations of the cross. Other artists who participate in this church are Rouault, who was a Christian. Uh, who did a lot of stained glass uh, for various churches, not only in France, but elsewhere too. And the third project that I want to show you is perhaps the most famous of all. Um, Couturier also worked when he got back to France with the architect Le Corbusier. And he found in Le Corbusier's architecture uh, a very, very high expression of the sacred. So what, what does the sacred mean? That's a very odd question, I know, but what differentiates the sacred from the profane? Another very odd question, but I think it's important for understanding Couturier's view. For Couturier, the sacred is something which takes us out of our normal relation to time and to space. Right? We live in what 
we now call a kind of horizontal time. We think of time as a line that moves forward, right? And for Couturier, what was important in a sacred space was that notion of time be broken, right? And that we live more in a kind of vertical relation to time, where things that in our normal concept, or, or what we would call events, don't happen serious, serially, but happen almost simultaneously, right? And you might think of a medieval painting, for example. When people first look at medieval paintings, they, they think, that's odd. You know, this is supposed to be Bethlehem, but there's a Renaissance castle over there, and these people, you can even see, you know, these people are dressed in 20th century business clothes, because it doesn't matter, right? The sacred moment takes us out of the normal way that we narrate time to ourselves, and that's what he thought a church or a sacred space should do. And so he was particularly attracted to Le Corbusier's architecture that was all about light and space and very little about ornament and decoration. Right. He also worked with Henri Matisse. So Matisse, of course, one of the most famous artists of the 20th century. But, um, I should mention that Couturier, in his youth, um, worked. he tried to paint. And he realized he wasn't a very good painter and that he wasn't going to get very far as a painter. So he turned to stained glass. And there he was actually quite good. And he did a number of stained glass windows uh, for various churches. But he met Matisse in the south of France. And by this time, Matisse was getting quite old and wasn't able to paint in quite the way he used to. But he was able to work with stencils and cutouts uh, and he, um, at the request of a nun who he had befriended, uh, was asked to do a chapel in the small town of Vence in the south of France, near Nice. But he knew nothing about stained glass. So he uh, had met Couturier through a mutual friend, and Couturier became, he became, at the end of the war, the person who actually went and looked for the colors and the glass that Matisse would use, and who raised the money for the chapel among uh, people he had come to know during his time in the United States and Canada during the Second World War. So it's very Matisse. If you're familiar with Matisse's style, you have no problem um, recognizing it here. Here's Couturier himself, older than the first photo that I showed you. Uh, working on one of his own stained glass windows. But here's Matisse. Now, the model on the wall on the right, you have Saint Dominique. And it was Couturier who modeled for that portrait. Right. And there's a very, very beautiful book of correspondence between Matisse and Couturier. Um, it's several, it's two or 300 pages, and Matisse of course, was not a believer either, right? And he was an older man, and, Couture, and he and Couturier exchanged letters over several years, not only about the actual project, but about questions of belief, questions of faith, uh, the relation of art to spirituality. And so Couturier had this talent for a man who, for a man of the church who, uh, Normally, most of the people that he interacted with would have very little to do with a priest uh, or with someone from the church. But in Couturier's case, this, this was an exception. And it was an exception over and over again. And what I want to look at a little bit here is um, why. What was it about his thinking and about his intervention that made that possible? There's another view with the light coming through at a different time of day. So I have to say that at the end of his life, and this is interesting, in the 1950s. So the 1950s, as you might know, was a period of the Cold War. You probably know about that. Uh, it was a period in the United States of McCarthyism, and it was a period in the church of anti-modernism, right? where modernism was seen once again as somehow tied to communism, uh, tied to, dis uh, to lack of belief. And 
in the church there was an, there was uh, an attack uh, mounted on couturier um, and this was an attack basically uh, waged by what were called the corporation so the corporation were the guilds of statue makers and altar makers uh, who have, for their own self-interest, of course, were very much opposed to the church going out and seeking independent artists to do this work. They wanted the contracts. Um, but this was also justified in theological terms, um, that really that the church had to protect its own and had to trust itself. So this was an issue of l'art sacré, right? And you can see the debate in France on art and religion. Right, so this was a debate that took place not only in the pages of Couturier's journal, but in the pages of various Vatican and other publications by different religious orders. So Father Couturier addressed issues that reached well beyond the crisis of sacred art in his own time. And the topics that they coalesce around are hardly foreign to a contemporary ear. Not only the relationship between abstract art and spirituality, but also a reflection on democracy and fascism, and especially what he saw as the thirst for order. Why is it that people crave order ab above all? Not only the relationship between national schools and an international style in art, but more generally the relationship between universalism and religious and national specificities. Traversing all of these questions is a reflection on the situation of Jews in the 20th century and the responsibility of Christian religious when speaking about Jews to their faithful. In other words, how does a priest talk to his congregation about Jews? And this was some, this reflection begins in theology, continues in politics, especially the politics of French clericalism and anti-clericalism, and finds its deepest expression in response to, this, to the conflagration of the Second World War, where anti-Semitism is not only at the heart of Nazi atrocities, but as Couturier himself quickly came to realize at the core of policies that were pursued quite autonomously by the French state that replaced the Third Republic. It didn't need any prompting. In some cases, it instituted anti-Semitic measures before the Nazis even asked for them. In fact, Couturier came to see a culture of anti-Semitism as central to France's undoing. This, and not some presumed Jewish Masonic Bolshevik conspiracy, a favorite mantra of the French right in the 1930s, lies at the heart of the moral bankruptcy that hastens the collapse of France. Recognizing these truths led Couturier to act in ways during the Second World War that earned him the profound respect and gratitude of exiles, refugees, and the disenfranchised. So who was he? I want to just talk a little bit about his background. Couturier, um, where he winds up in some ways is very surprising. Um, he comes from the provinces, right? And in many ways, his story is a typically French one, a young, talented person who, as they say in French, will wind up to monter à Paris. I think the verb says everything, to ascend Paris. Right? And there's this view in, Paris, in France, that especially at this time, that if you have talent, you'll wind up in Paris. Right? And indeed, he did. Right? But while there is little in his young life to suggest that he's going to wind up as a priest, that isn't to say that Catholicism isn't, in fact, the, the, the milieu in which he grows up. Everything that we, that we see shows us that Catholicism was the very culture of his native region. Right? And his region is near the city of Lyon in the south of France, okay? in a land profoundly marked by fundamental unresolved divisions that go all the way back to the revolution 
a hundred, only about a hundred years earlier, by the, when Hugues Couturier is born, here was what was called La France, la fille aînée de l'Église. La France, the eldest daughter of the church. Right? This is how traditionalists in France like to think of themselves, for whom national identity was defined in terms of ancestry and faith. In other words, the conviction that Frenchness and Catholicism were inseparable and themselves tied to a fundamentally rural way of life. And in Couturier's milieu, the milieu he grew up in, this would have been self-evident. Right? This was not even probably a debate. What might be surprising is how rural France still was in the early 20th century. Right? In other words, uh, when you might think of France, you may think of, the, of Paris. But in the, uh, it's not until 1931 that the urban population of France surpasses its rural population. And by urban here, we, don't, we mean what are counted are, are towns of 2,000 people or more. So we're not even talking about large cities. Right? And manual workers in, in 1930 only represent about one third of the entire labor force in France, which is still, still very much a country defined by its rural character. Couturier's own family owned a small mill, so they were part of the middle class, to which various farmers brought their grain. Right? So they were part of the local elite, if we can call it that. And they were a very cultured family. When I did research on the family, there were every child in the family played a musical instrument. Uh, they had regular soiree where there were little concerts and recitals and people read poetry. And this is, I just tried to give you a sense uh, of this kind of milieu. It was also a milieu that was haunted by two, what it saw as two threats. Uh, on the one hand, the threat of socialism, and on the other hand, the threat of what it called voracious capitalism. Right? The, and they began to see the democratic and parliamentary system of the Third Republic, the republic that was instituted in the 1870s uh, after the defeat of France in the Franco-Prussian War and that ended with the Nazi occupation, they began to see that as far too risky. It left the door open to too many potential problems. Partisans of the parliamentary parties of the right enjoyed that enjoyed large support in rural areas spoke fondly of organic regimes right, that combined central authority derived from principles of lineage and regional authority by those exercised by those who belonged. Right? For many in these milieu, the Dreyfus affair that shook France in the closing years of the 19th century had finished more, furnished more than sufficient proof of what was problematic with the Republic. How, do, you, do you know about the Dreyfus affair? Yeah. Good, <laughs> so I don't have to explain it. I'm just going to go quickly here. So this, of course, is a famous uh, line, uh, linotype that appeared in the French press. This is Captain Dreyfus uh, being degraded, right? In other words, having all his military insignia taken from him his sword broken, and then, of course, sent off to exile in Devil's Island. Right? Of course, it is true and important right, to recall that for many anti dreyfusards the captain, falsely accused of passing military secrets to Germany, was guilty because he was Jewish, or, if you like, Jewish and therefore guilty. Right? So here's um, the, only one of hundreds of examples of the kind of anti-Semitic uh, propaganda that was circulating in France around the time of the Dreyfus affair. Right? And uh, in this cartoon, the gist is no matter how, long, how, how hard you try and scrub Dreyfus, he's guilty. Right? Like you, can, you can scrub them, but of course, if you're a very stereotypical Jew who's doing the scrubbing, but it's all in vain because it's in his blood right, to actually be a, tra a traitor. 
This is uh, another image, which is actually a little bit later, but um, these are, this is um, Le Juif et la France, right? and I think, again, I don't have to explain it. I think the image conveys exactly uh, what the anti-Semitic uh, stereotype is here. But this notion that Jews are basically outsiders to France, even though there is Jewish settlement in France going back to Roman times, Right, that they basically are there to cause trouble through a secret conspiracy that is somehow both capitalist and communist. So rich Jewish bankers fund communist revolutionaries, all to supplant French culture. We heard a little bit of that recently, I think, uh, somewhere else. Um, and. Uh, So if Jewish guilt was redundant, precisely because in the minds of such people, the two words were synonymous, what was truly scandalous for them was that the fate of a mere Jew could so imperil the great institutions of the country. In other words, what the anti-Dreyfus arts was, you know, even those who conceded, perhaps the charges were trumped up, perhaps Dreyfus was innocent, that was not important because what became the important issue for them was the honor of the army, right? So if exonerating Dreyfus meant implicating the army, one couldn't do that, right? And so uh, Couturier, of course, would come to take a position quite diametrically opposed to this, that it was, in fact, the honor of the country depended on the truth for Dreyfus. Leon Blum, who was Jewish and the, a socialist intellectual and the future president, the president du conseil of the popular front government in the 1930s, would recall in his memoirs how the Dreyfus affair, uh, in the Dreyfus affair, he says, and I'm just quoting him, the parliament and the country had divided into two entrenched camps, separated by a deep gulf. Public passions were violent, but no one was fighting any longer for or against Dreyfus, for or against the revision of the judgment, now one fought for or against the republic, for or against militarism, for or against the secularism of the state. So Dreyfus becomes this larger than life symbol where the person of Dreyfus hardly matters anymore. And it's through the campaigns of people like Zola and many others that the person of Dreyfus is finally exonerated and brought back from Devil's Island, uh, where he was to spend the rest of his life. In the wake of the Dreyfus Affair, the French anti-Semitic press flourished. It was particularly well represented in the provinces, in places where, in a place like where Couturier lived. La France Juive sold 80% of its 800,000 daily copies in the provinces. 800,000 daily copies of uh, images like this, right, or the one that I showed you before. The even the independent provincial press was largely won over to anti-Semitic theses. In early 1898, there were demonstrations demanding that Jews be purged from state administrations they supposedly dominated. And this was an obsession that would return under Vichy. Extra-parliamentary league, uh, leagues or clubs committed above all to the defense of Catholicism against internal enemies, especially Jews, and whose name recalled those of the anti-Protestant campaigners of the 16th century, exploited anti-Semitism as the most satisfactory formula for crystallizing a package of social and class resentments. Now, the most formidable of these leagues, and it's important because it relates to Couturier, was the Action Française, uh, founded in 1899. And it would come to exercise a special attraction for Pierre and his brother, Jean. The group's theorist was Charles Morat. I don't know if any of you ever. So Charles Morat was a very powerful figure in French intellectual circles. And uh, I don't know how many of you can read French, but these are just some of the quotations that Mo 
only a few of thousands that uh, Moirat said. So Léon Blum, who was the president du Conseil of France, this naturalized German Jew is not to be treated like an ordinary or a normal person. It's an answer to the Democratic Republic? Yes. Um, Human garbage to be treated as such. Right? This is a man to be shot, but to be shot in the back. Right? So these are um, not from 1899, right? These are from 1935. In other words, the Nazis have been in power for two years already in Germany. And Morval was an enthusiastic anti-Semite, right? He was an enthusiastic anti-Semite. He was also a royalist, right? And this was odd. In other words, he belonged to that counter-revolutionary tradition in France that goes all the way back to the revolution of various groups that dreamed of restoring the French monarchy. But for Morat, his royalism was different. He didn't base it in a kind of notion of royal lineage, right? He, he saw his royalism as a kind of device, and so too his Catholicism. He was Catholic who wasn't that interested in Christianity, if I can put it that way. He saw Catholicism as a kind of cultural glue that held the nation together and that allowed the French to define very clearly who was in and who was out. Right? So he was for an authoritarian regime that made use of Christianity to promote a restoration of the French monarchy. And for that reason, he got in trouble with the church. So the Vatican uh, issued its first condemnation of the Action Française in, the 1920s, in 1926. And they said that the problem with it is that as a, it was Catholic by calculation, not by conviction. The men who lead the Action Française use the church or at least hope to use it. They do not serve it because they reject the divine message whose propagation is the mission of the church. And shortly thereafter, the Vatican prohibited Catholics from reading the newspapers of the Action Française and, by, and eventually from belonging to the group itself. Okay. It's interesting that in 1939, with the outbreak of the war, Pope Pius XII reversed that ban. Right? And he uh, lifted the ban on the Action Française uh, at a time when uh, its uh, leaders were being out outwardly and unashamedly anti-Semitic. Um, now, a reason the Action Française is so important is because Couturier, as a young man, was involved with it, which may seem very surprising when I go on to tell you. But again, in his milieu, this would have been quite normal. Republicanism seemed like a disease uh, to people uh, in this area, in that it upset hierarchies, it promoted notions of liberty that seemed to be notions of chaos, right? And so Moraz, uh, Moraz claims were met with great receptivity. So Couturier himself, um, sorry, I'll go here first. Couturier himself belonged to a group that was called Les Camelots du Roi. Right? And this was a kind of armed young youth militia right? that would sort of patrol the streets and be on the lookout for you know, leftists or people who were involved in demonstrations or strikes. They would guard printing presses of the Catholic leagues uh, and smash the printing presses of other people. They were not the only armed groups uh, on the streets of Paris at this time. But it's interesting that when Couturier went to Paris as a young man to study art, he also found the time to join this group. Right. So I'm just trying to signal to you that uh, his, his, uh, his upbringing, right, nothing in his upbringing presages what's going, the turn that he's going to take. Yeah. But he is training to be a priest. And when the Vatican begins to condemn the Action Francaise, 
This actually is a moment which gives him pause, right? So he, he obeys the church. Uh, he no longer frequents the Action Francaise. And then he begins to actually take his distance theologically and ideologically from it. And that transition only happens definitively uh, with the Nazi occupation and with the rise of Hitler. So now I want to talk a little bit about what happens to Couturier during the war. Um, and that's, that's where Canada comes in. I told we would get there eventually, right? So Couturier was invited in 1940 to New York City. And he was invited to preach at the French church in Manhattan. I think it's called Saint-Louis de France. Um, and this was during the Lenten season. Now, by this time, France was officially at war with Germany. A war had been declared in September of 1939. But it was a period that was known as the Drôle de Guerre, you know, the odd war, because there was no fighting. So, until May or June of 1940, there was this weird situation where France and Germany were at war, but there was no actual fighting or actual engagement. So Couturier goes off to New York City to preach uh, Lent. And while he's in New York City, he's invited up to Montreal by friends of his who are teaching in Montreal to give some talks about art and spirituality. So, before Couturier had come to Canada, he had published a book called Art et Catholicisme, Art and Catholicism, in which he makes arguments for modern artists like Matisse, uh, Léger, people like this. But while he's in Quebec, he publishes a new edition of this book with a new essay in which he argues for the spiritual nature of abstract art. Okay, so this is um, this is interesting for however once France is invaded things change very quickly right the France is invaded it's divided into two zones the occupied zone which is directly administered by the Nazis and the so-called free zone which is governed by the regime at Vichy under Maréchal Pétain right so what happens is the the National Assembly of the Third Republic votes to dissolve itself. It flees to Bordeaux. It votes to dissolve itself and give all power to Pétain. Right? And um, the, um, the news devise, what is the devise of the French Republic, of all French republics? Good. Liberté, égalité, fraternité. Right? So what is the devise of l'état français, as Vichy, France is known? Anybody remember or know? Travail, famille, patrie, right? Work, homeland, uh, and family. Or work, family, and homeland, right? And um, so this all happens very quickly. And Couturier is in North America at this point. He's very concerned about France, about the situation in France, but he's told by his Dominican order to stay in North America. Uh, they say to him, there's really no point in you coming home. There's really not much that you can do here given the circumstances. Stay and learn, uh, as it were. So in North America, in Couturier spent most of his time in New York City and Montreal going back and forth. Like many French from a, a, a rural background or from, and also from a clerical background, New York was a fascinating but alienating milieu for him. Uh, it was fascinating because you can imagine, um, especially in the 1940s, the city of skyscrapers and noise and bustle and unrelenting commerce, right, seem to represent everything that the sort of Protestant, Anglo-Protestant materialist spirit represented. And so he, of course, is fascinated by this. There were also a number of French exiles 
in New York. Uh, Jacques Maritain, I don't know if any of you, Jacques Maritain was a major neo-Thomist philosopher um, who had reform ideas about the Catholic Church. Um, there was um, Henri Faucillon, who wrote a very important book called uh, Forms and Art, also in a kind of spiritual vein. So there were people for Couturier to talk to. Um, but it was also interesting that his own order in New York, the Dominicans, were very pro vichy So the Archbishop of New York City, whose name was Spellman, who eventually became Cardinal Spellman, one of the most famous American cardinals, actually de decided that Couturier was, could no longer preach in Catholic churches in New York, uh, and he was no longer welcome to live at the Dominican residence. Why? Because Couturier, very early in his stay, began to understand the collaborationist nature of the Vichy regime and began to denounce several things in particular, one being the agreement of the Vichy regime to hand over German refugees back to the Nazis. So one of the first things the Nazis did when they occupied France was to demand that France return all the political dissidents that had fled to France. And Vichy just said, OK. And so they did. And for Couturier, this was outrageous, that it betrayed everything France stood for. The other, as we'll see in a minute, the other issue were the anti-Semitic policies of France. Now, Quebec was a bit, might seem a bit paradoxical. I just, I'll just say that because Couturier could no longer preach in Catholic churches in New York City, he found another place to preach. He went to Harlem. So what do you know about Harlem in New York in the 1920s and 30s? Anything? No, it's just paradise. Pardon me? Is this the time of the Harlem Renaissance? Or yes, it? yes it is. So what is the Harlem Renaissance? It's sort of like a lot of poets because they're still sort of like, um, let's say, leftover sort of uh, discrimination in the South. They decide that to leave New York or sort of going to New York to set up a new life would be sort of like a better thing to do. So a lot of the poets that comes through he was ever sort of like other names, mm -hmm. sort of became very big to there, began to write there, began to interact with each other. That's right. So Harlem was a thriving cultural scene, especially for African Americans. But there were a lot of white New Yorkers who would go to Harlem, right, to uh, actually participate in this theme, uh, in this scene. So Couturier went up to Harlem. Um, he became very good friends with people like the blues singer Ethel Waters, uh, with the photographer Carl Van Vechten, who's very famous for his portraits of the Harlem Renaissance. And he preached in black churches. Quite remarkable, right? At the same time, in Quebec, the situation was a bit different. So when he came, when he came up to Quebec, <clears throat> he felt that he discovered a kind of natural sympathy for a way of life that reminded him very much of the, way, of the ways of life in which he grew up. In other words, once he left Montreal and went into the Quebec countryside, he found a kind of social organization and a kind of culture that was very close to his heart. And what he also found uh, was a form of religious art that he felt had not yet been spoiled by industrial reproduction. That uh, church art in these small parishes and small villages of rural Quebec remained very much artisanal and what he considered to be authentic. Right? And in Montreal, he made friends with people who were at an institution called the École du Meuble. So there were two big institutions. One was the École des Beaux-Arts, the fine arts school, which I talked about earlier. The other was the craft school. And the craft school attracted all kinds of younger, more adventurous artists. And it's here that Couturier began to work with the group of artists that later on would be known as the automatistes, the automatists. I'm just going to go back here for a minute. Uh -oh. Pardon me. Okay, I have to go more slowly. 
Do you want to go back to the slideshow? This is, uh, this is okay. Um, I just wanted to get to this oh. slide. So, and yeah, back to slideshow. Thank you. Great. <clears throat> so, Couturier began to work with a group of young artists that in 1948 would publish this manifesto called Refus Global, which in English, I guess, would translate as total rejection, kind of says everything. And if you look at the, the graphic style, you can see that what these automatists believed in, like the surrealists in France, was a kind of automatic writing. Painting is a kind of automatic writing that, went, that got back in touch with the unconscious and back in touch with desire. And the, the manifesto basically denounces what it seems, sees as a regime of conformity and of fear in Quebec. It sees the official church of having played a role in convincing people that they should not be audacious, that they should not seek creative freedom, they should simply conform. Right? And the manifesto had a huge impact when it came out in 1948. The authors of the manifesto were almost chased out of Quebec. Um, and, um, but this is the group that Couturier actually uh, helped protect uh, and uh, gave um, shelter to in his earlier years. The other interesting thing is the Dominicans in Quebec were more advanced in their views than the Dominicans in New York City. So where the Dominicans in New York City kicked Couturier out, the Dominicans in Quebec welcomed him. And this, uh, this was uh, also something which made his situation more interesting. But in the larger sense, Couturier was confronted with a church in Quebec, which, like the church in France, saw a great opportunity in Vichy. Right? And if you looked at the popular press in Quebec at this time, they were absolutely um, ecstatic that Vichy had happened, because they said, well, all the policies that Vichy has undertaken at this time are things that we in Quebec would approve of. And maybe what will happen is France will once again be able to get back on the road uh, of an Orthodox Catholic society, much as we have preserved it here in Quebec. So Couturier was very uneasy with these positions. And you can imagine his paradoxical position, a Dominican with great authority coming from France to a country where the church hierarchy expected one view of him and where, he, in fact, he had delivered quite another. So in North America, I'm just going to give you a few uh, quotes about this. In North America, Father Couturier encountered numerous individuals who were delighted by Vichy's national revolution, right? And um, I will, here's a quote uh, from one uh, such journal. This was called L'Action Nationale. So the name itself shows you how inspired they were by Morat and L'Action Francaise. So this is by a man named Roger Duhamel. He applauds Pétain. This is very soon after the Pétain regime is set up. He applauds Pétain for, I quote, clearing the Jews out of administrative functions where they, have, they had certainly come to take up too much space. And he celebrates the program of what Pétain called his national revolution. Isn't it true that up until now, the Vichy regime has adopted measures that merit our sympathy? On the whole, French Canadians applaud this magnificent labor of recreation. They rejoice that Maréchal Pétain had made it clear that there is no longer a place for lies. France lives on. So, for Father Couturier, I won't go into detail because we don't have time, but it's clear from his correspondence and from the record that he 
he takes his distance from Vichy very, very quickly, within one or two months, much faster than many people that today we regard as heroes of the resistance. Right? People who were actually much more involved with Vichy for the first two years or even three years of its, of its existence. And it's interesting, of course, because Couturier was a priest, he tends to be overlooked in this history, while the record shows that, in fact, he understood much more quickly than others what this was all about. Right? Father Couturier's opposition to Vichy crystallizes around a series of betrayals of refugees, of France's historic legacy, and of Christian principles. He recognized that Vichy's pervasive anti-Semitism was not merely a rhetorical expedient serving a larger ideological purpose, but a fundamental element of Vichy's national revolution. He refers to Vichy as, quote, the harsh ransom of the Dreyfus affair. And even Morat himself says as the same. When Morat was tried after the Second World War and found guilty of collaboration, he shouted out in court, it's the revenge of Dreyfus. Right? So these issues die hard, uh, and both sides understood this. He was, as I said before, he was particularly outraged by Vichy's persecution of those who had fled the Nazi regime. Of all the wounds inflicted by the armistice, he regards this as the most serious. He also reacts vehemently to the dissolution of the Masonic lodges, which may seem surprising for a priest. Right? But although he is unsympathetic to the Masons, he sees in this repressive measure a denial of the dualism that he sees in French national identity. For Couturier, France is a unique mixture of what he calls, and I'm quoting him, that ind indivisible power of clarity and emancipation, which each in his turn has given us the ordered splendor of the monarchy and the great flame of the revolution. Although later on he goes to say that everything good that has happened in France since the revolutions has happened because of the revolution. So it's an interesting uh, position that he takes. Uh, Couturier corresponds frequently with his family, especially with his brother and his mother while he's in Canada. But at one point, he stops answering them. And you have, they begin to wonder why. They begin to wonder if there's something wrong, if he's sick, if he's not getting their letters. And finally, he decides he has to answer. And the reason why he stopped answering, or he had, is because of the virulent anti-Semitism of the letters that he was getting from his family. And, um, they even, his brother writes them about how wonderful it is that Mora came to their town and they came over for dinner and they had a lovely dinner with Mora and they talked about how wonderful it is that there were no more Jews in the public service and so on and so forth. So he begins, he finally writes back, right? And he writes to his family, as, con as concerns the Jews, I beg of you, remember that you are Christians that charity tolerates no anti-Semitism. And even if certain measures seem politically inevitable among those who have been conquered, the French, at least let us maintain the integrity of our hearts, justice and clarity, first of all. Anti-Semitism offends them both. I know very well that these ideas are not fashionable today. But Christianity is Christianity. And really, don't you think there is enough hatred in the world and enough persecution? As for me, I have admirable Jewish friends and fully intend to be loyal to, uh, loyal to them. In a similar spirit, and what's interesting, and from the very beginning of his time in North America, Couturier expresses irritation with the religious sectarianism of many of his hosts. Unlike most of his religious brethren, Couturier had already responded with equanimity to the militantly secularist politics of the Third Republic. When the Third Republic officially legislated the separation of church and state, right? That was, the church was up in arms uh, in France about this. But not Couturier. He actually thought this was a good thing, right? Even as a younger man, even, even when he was sympathetic to uh, more uh, monarchist uh, views. 
He says, what the church lost in external freedom, it won in internal freedom, very precisely in spiritual freedom. He condemns the tendency of clerics towards servility, a disposition towards submitting to power, and which ranges from conformism to extreme docility. And he especially condemns clericalism, the corruption of spiritual authority into areas where it has no business, and to which clerics intellectually and practically accustomed to dogmatic solutions are quite inclined. So it's quite, a, again, a remarkable position. And coming to Quebec where the church saw itself as the guarantor of the French Canadian people, right? this was a very audacious position to take. And he took it frequently and openly and complained in, in public, in writing, on the radio uh, about this. So for example, one of the most frequent questions um, people um, Wanted to, uh, wanted to know is they would, they would ask him, how many Catholics are there in the new rightist government that has succeeded the Popular Front right, after, the war, uh, after the Popular Front fell in 1938? And his answer was, I quote, we prefer a Jew in office who knows his job to a Catholic who doesn't. It hasn't really been that wonderful for us in the past to have Catholics in power, even honest ones which doesn't necessarily go without saying. Couturier in Quebec spends a fair amount of time counseling Jewish refugees, of which there are, there are many, and in New York. Uh, both cities receive a large number uh, of, of, of intellectual exiles. We shouldn't exaggerate, because during the war, both countries had very severe policies limiting the entry of Jewish refugees. But some people got there before the war. Uh, and that's also very uh, in, important. When you talk about a priest counseling Jews, the question of conversion obviously comes up. Right? And Couturier, again, here was very firm on this. Um, he reveals a consistent refusal to capitalize on the vulnerability and misfortune of the Jews that he's counseling. Instead, his reflections are framed within a larger discourse on the failings of Christian Europe and a condemnation of anti-Semitism. In his Christmas sermon in 1941, he asks his congregation, and I quote him, if the pariahs of all lands, the Negroes, as they say at the time, the Negroes and the Jews decided to believe us and came to hear and see the word of the gospel, how many of them would even dare pass through the door? For there is, alas, a clerical anti-Semitism that is much more widespread than we dare admit. Most of his writings about anti-Semitism are dedicated to crit critiquing the clericalist milieu he knows so well, right? And uh, I could, but there are many, many examples uh, that I could give. He says, um, no shameful act, <clears throat> and you have to always understand the context in which these remarks are being made. He's, he's arguing with his fellow priests, with his fellow Catholics. He says, no shameful act ever committed by a Jew has not at some time or other been equaled by a Christian. For Couturier, it is individual human beings and, and, uh, as men and women that sin, not Jews or Christians. And I quote him, Yes, they, meaning Jews, have all those faults and all those sins. It's true. I am familiar with all of them. They are the same as those of Christians. Our own, exactly the very same ones. At the end of the war, Couturier returns to France to undertake the projects that I showed you uh, earlier on. He only comes back to North America one more time. And he comes back to a country that's utterly changed. Right. He leaves a place where he has made an enormous, he's left an enormous impact, uh, where he has worked with those younger reformist forces in Catholicism, in intellectual and literary journals, in artistic movements that have 
a, a view of Catholicism that is much less institutional in its framework and much more tied to notions of personal faith. Uh, someone like Edmond Mounier in France, who was the uh, perpetrated a, a philosophy, a theology known as personalism, right? um, and who founded a journal called es Esprit, uh, as someone who was very much uh, within this kind of current. So in some ways, it is often said that Couturier uh, in Quebec uh, instinctually finds his allies among those forces that would help make the quiet revolution, which we'll talk about tomorrow. Right? And within the church, those forces that would begin, that would be moving toward Vatican II, right? which would happen after his death. Surveying the, de the devastation before him in his native France and throughout the world, Father Couturier wonders why order was able to prevail as such a compelling imperative for so many people and lead to such disastrous, disorderly consequences. He is forced to conclude, and I quote him, that in each one of us there is a lurking fascist or racist, a man ready to abuse the principle of authority or even just the pride of authority, a man ready to betray, to surrender the inalienable rights of the human being to prejudices of color or race. In this, he sees the Second World War as more than a conflict among nations. <clears throat> as early as 1942, Couturier characterizes the war as, quote, revolutionary, meaning a war in which, quote, the victory of Germany <coughs> over France was at the same time the victory of some Frenchmen over other Frenchmen. He blames the cowardice of the European democracies, unable to respond to the needs of the poor and the oppressed, for rendering fascism a palatable option for so many desperate people. I quote him, it's through such neglect that we gaily prepare slavish souls and lead the poor to become weary and disgusted with freedom. In the final analysis, Maria Alain Couturier's transformation from a young Maurassien, a follower of the Action Française, to a defender of La France Libre and an intrepid transgressor of sectarian, class, and ideological lines may be ascribed to a fundamental principle. Observing how the world can finally be divided into two kinds of people, those who cherish freedom above all else, and those who don't, he affirms, and I quote, as for myself, I love only freedom, and as I get older, I couldn't care less about the rest. But this freedom is not only, and I quote, toward everything and against everything. One also has to remain free in relation to oneself, observes Couturier, for, and I quote, there is no enslavement worse than internal enslavement or subservience. In what must be regarded as an interrogation of his own youthful yearning for order and hierarchy, Couturier comes to believe that the really meaningful choices in life are between authority or justice, security or audacity. In his vigorous refutation of the anti-Semitism of Vichy France and its admirers, Father Couturier chose justice and audacity again and again. Thanks.